Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're doing another Strengths Materials video. Uh, and today we're going to be covering a topic that uh, is usually the crossover point to another semester, or at least it was for my university. And this is where you kind of get thrown in the deep end with new concepts that are kind of foreign. Uh, and the first one they throw at you is, is torque. Uh, and they generally rush it and really uh, throw every concept about torque at the same time at you. So I'm going to take it pretty slow with these videos and go over the basics. In this first video, I just want to break down what torque is, where it comes from, and, and do a simple problem. And then we're going to build off of that. Uh, now, the best way to explain what torsion or torque is, is just to recall what we already know. And that's moment. Now, moment is a measure of a force's bending effect. And this is created by force at a certain distance away from a point. Now, if we look over here at this member, uh, we have a moment that's being created, right? And we know that this moment, if we took a cut of our section, it's going to be acting in line with that longitudinal axis, uh, which pretty much means that we have it parallel to that line. And what the longitudinal axis is, is pretty much that line that goes from uh, one end to the other or from one support to the other. Uh, you can just imagine it as the imaginary line that runs, runs straight through the member. Um, now, in this way, if we looked at what torsion uh, means for a member, it's going to be something very similar. Uh, the only difference is now, torsion is a force that acts about a longitudinal member's axis, meaning that we are rotating around that line that goes from one end to the other. And in summary, torsion is a moment that twists the member about the longitudinal axis. Now, from this diagram, we see uh, an undeformed cylinder or shaft or member, whatever you want to call it. And we have a deformed member where we have the torque applied at both ends. And you can pick up a couple things from this. You can see that these lines running parallel to the longitudinal axis are deforming as the member is twisting but you can see that the circular uh, segments are still remaining circular. They're just rotating with that torsional force. Uh, and if we look at the ends of our members, if we imagine that our member was uh, free, then we're gonna have an equal and opposite angle that's created based on that twist at both ends uh, of the member. Now, the derivation for torsion is a little bit complex. Uh, and we don't need to dive into like all of the uh, strict fundamental derivation techniques that are going into it, but we can talk about some of the basics that go into the formula. And the first thing that we're going to need to recall to understand this derivation is shear stress. And if you don't remember, you can click the video at the top, but pretty much shear stress uh, is the change in size of an element. And if we look at an element uh, on our shaft here, we can just cut out this square. Uh, square section right here, and we can analyze what's going on. We have the same thing happening uh, at the face of our member. We're going to have a shear stress that's developed. And where the internal torque is developing, shear stress is also developing at a distance p uh, from the longitudinal axis based on that specific element that we're looking at. From our understanding of moment, obviously at the top right here, we have moment, which is equal to force times distance. So we know that the further away you go from this longitudinal axis, the greater your stress is actually going to be. And you have your max shear stress developing all the way at the edge of our member, which is at point C. And we're going to have no shear stress developed at the longitudinal axis. Now let's look at the derivation again. We need to extract two relationships. And the first one is something we've already discussed, where shear stress is pretty much a relationship of the distance to your element or the point that you're interested in over the max distance that you can possibly go in that member times the torque uh, applied. And that's the first relationship that you need to know. Uh, now, the second is a little bit trickier. We need to understand that the torque produced by the stress uh, distribution over the entire cross section has to be equivalent to the internal torque that is being developed or applied at the section in order to remain in equilibrium. Now, all of these words pretty much just 
summarize into this uh, relationship right here. And you can see the relationship uh, is very similar to what we've already covered in this moment formula, where you have torque, which is basically just moment, just a little bit fancier. Uh, same units, same everything. It's going to be equal to your distance from that longitudinal axis uh, times uh, the shear stress times the area. And these all break down into components that we've seen before and had videos on. So it's all just calling back to what we've learned before. Now, putting these two relationships together, and after a little bit of simplification, we're left with these two formulas down here, uh, where it's giving us the formula for torque. And we have a couple variables that we just need to talk about. And the first one is the shear stress that developed that is developing based on the torque being applied times j, which is a new constant that we haven't really talked about yet, but it's pretty much just the polar moment of inertia. What that means, it's the resistance to torsional distortion. And this is a unique property of every cross-section. Uh, and specifically for circular members, we have j is equal to this formula down here, which is pi times r uh, outside to the 4 minus r inside to the power of 4 over 2. So if you imagine that we had a pipe, we have an outside diameter and an inside diameter, uh, it's just pretty much taking the difference of those two and getting rid of that hollow section, similar to previous moment of inertia problems uh, with irregular shapes. And C, which is the max distance away from the longitudinal axis. Now, if all these words don't make sense, we're gonna go ahead and just take these formulas and apply them to a simple problem here. Uh, and these problems are going to be based on two fundamental things, which is we have a shaft or a circular member, and we also have a linearly elastic shaft, which means that uh, Hooke's laws are applying. Uh, and what Hooke's law is, if we don't remember, is just stress is proportional to the strain. Now let's see these formulas in action in this problem. All right, so let's hop into the problem. Uh, it's pretty much asking us to analyze a solid shaft. And this shaft is made of a material that has an allowable shear stress of 10 MPa. And it wants us to determine the required diameter of this shaft such that we do not exceed this max shearing stress. The first thing that should jump out to us in any type of torque problem is to notice the torques being applied. And we can see that there's going to be some in the clockwise direction and some are going to be in the counterclockwise direction. So we need to have a set convention from the jump. Uh, the second thing that we need to understand is that this problem is asking for a diameter. So the only way to get to a diameter is to go back to the polar moment of inertia formula and isolate for one of these radius or diameter, as you'll see in this problem, uh, to get that value. So let's start off enough with the talking. Uh, let's pick a sign convention. So just for now, let's go with counterclockwise is going to be negative and clockwise is going to be positive. The second thing we need to do is fill in the torque diagram. Why do we need to do this? We need to do this so that we can get our variable for torque. If our max shear stress happens at 10 MPa, we need to know what the max torque is that is acting on the system uh, in order to solve for the diameter at that point in the system. Uh, now we can go ahead and fill in this table based on our convention. So if we look at point A, this is going in a counterclockwise direction. So we're going to have a line that looks something like this. And we're going to have 15. Then similar, we have another one here. And these are simply additive. So we're going to have 15 plus 25, and that's going to give us 40. Now moving on to the next point in our system, we are going in the clockwise direction, and we have 30. So if we have 40 minus 30, we're going to be left with 10. And if we look to the next point, we have a 60, which is in the counterclockwise direction, meaning that we have a value of 70 here. And we have 70 applied in the opposite direction at the other end, meaning that it's going to bring everything back to zero. Okay. So now what do we need to do? Now we need to look at our formulas here 
and try to solve for this magic uh, diameter. And we can look at this formula a little bit differently. We were looking at shear max, and what did shear max represent? Well, we can simply rearrange this formula just so that it makes a little bit more sense. Shear max is going to be equal to the max torque applied to the system times C. But in our case, C, if we recall, is the furthest distance away from the longitudinal axis to the edge of the member. So that's simply going to be your diameter over 2. And then you have it over your polar moment of inertia. And we are recalling what polar moment of inertia is here with your outside inside diameter. But since we have a solid shaft, we don't need to worry about that inside diameter. And we are simply left with RO, which is the outside. But we know that R is just two times itself to give you the diameter. So that means R in this case will be D over two. Rewriting that, we are left with pi D over two, the power of four, and that's gonna be all over two. Now let's go ahead and plug in some numbers here. We're gonna have 10 newtons per millimeter squared for MPA here. We have 70 as our max torque at the system, newton millimeter, uh, D over two, and then that same formula we have here, D over two, the power of four, over two. You're noticing the 10 to three here, just to make Newton per meter into Newton millimeter. Now going to the next step of simplification, we have this two dividing by this to give you 35 instead of 70, 10 to three Newton per millimeter. And you're left with just the single parameter D here over pi over 32 D to the power of four. You'll notice that this is going to cancel this D over here, making that a three. And then isolating everything for your diameter, you're going to be left with the cubic root. This comes over, you bring over the root. You're left with a cubic root of 35 times 10 to the 3 newton millimeter over 10 newtons per millimeter squared times pi over 32, which is going to leave you with a final answer of 32.91 millimeters. All right, hopefully. Uh, Everything here made sense. I know I kind of rushed to the end of the simplification here, but I just wanted uh, this video not to run on for too long. Uh, if you have any questions, just leave it in the comments. And thanks for watching, guys.